when you concentrate on the business of enslavement and the business of slavery, and you look at the output and the profits that enslavers reaped from that enterprise, it can look very efficient. If you look at it from the perspective of the enslaved, it's theft, it's taking their labor. And more importantly, it's not even efficient theft, it's inefficient theft. It's taking their labor, and it's not even taking it in a way in which it's worth as much in terms of the output as they would value their own leisure to themselves. I'm Trevon Logan, a professor of economics at The Ohio State University and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. One of the things that my work on enslavement has convinced me is that economic def definitions of efficiency are actually not as consistent as we might have uh, previously expected. One way that people define uh, efficient is you know, the efficient use of resources, in other words, less wastage. So a production process, for example, taking those inputs and producing a greater amount of output would be more efficient than a production process that took the same inputs and produced less in terms of output. So when people are talking about enslavement, they speak about it being efficient because during the antebellum era, you had an input of capital. You had an input of what I have come to call quasi-labor capital in the form of enslaved people because they could also be a form of capital. They could be purchased and sold. And then you have land in an agricultural production function, primarily producing some output. People are typically thinking about cotton when they're thinking about the antebellum South. But it's important to understand that that includes sugar, which is produced further deeper into the South, particularly in Louisiana, and uh, tobacco that's produced, for example, um, in um, the Carolinas and up into uh, Virginia. But cotton really does have the center of economist and historian's attention about enslavement because the productivity there, quote unquote, the efficiency, if you will, was extremely high. In other words, for the same labor input and the same capital input, you would produce so much more cotton than you uh, would tobacco or, or sugar. And so it's seen as this very efficient process. And the older literature in economic history talked about how that efficiency came about, how um, there really was this high level of productivity or high level of output produced by those inputs. And that included the, the gang labor system, where you had and you see the significant uh, economies of scale when you have more than 10 enslaved people working because they could work in small groups and they are literally farming together and chopping the land and picking and you can speed their work up. What I would really call a historical assembly line where you can sort of flip on a switch um, and have the workers work much faster. And that's been really where people have been thinking about efficiency. And so that's been the way that everybody's talked about it for quite some time. And there's a problem with that. And I think that the problem to me is in that, what I called that quasi labor capital piece, which is that if you view enslaved people as just the labor input, you've implicitly assumed some sort of market function for their presence in this market, right? That they're labor. And they're labor, but they're not labor. They are forced labor. And so when you begin thinking about efficiency there, now you have to take account of something else. And the something else is maybe there is something else that they would rather be doing than working in this system. And that has to have value to them. And once you think about the value that it has to them versus what they're compensated for, for their productivity, it might not turn out that this is such an efficient system. Right. So when you concentrate on the business of enslavement and the business of slavery and you look at the output and the profits that enslavers reaped from that enterprise, it can look very efficient. If you look at it from the perspective of the enslaved, it's theft. It's taking their labor. And more importantly, it's not even efficient theft. It's inefficient theft. It's taking their labor. And it's not even taking it in a way in which it's worth as much in terms of the output 
as they would value their own leisure to themselves. I'm trying to incorporate in thinking about enslavement as a total social system. There are things that happen in enslavement that are beyond the market. It's not just about taking enslaved people and using their labor to produce an output. It is also very much a social system. And part of that social system requires the debasement of people to continually reestablish their social position as enslaved people. And those are ideas that historians and humanists have been much more taken with in the last 20 or 30 years than economists in understanding the interplay between a economic system that is certainly capitalistic in its orientation and about profit maximizing, but also exists in a social world which has racial enslavement and how those two map onto each other does not necessarily imply that everything going on in the plantation has a market explanation and that everything on the plantation going on is something that is done necessarily to derive profit. The issue about the cost of enslavement that we thought about is only from the perspective of an enslaver. And that is, the person has, they either have no cost, right, if you have enslaved people um, who have given birth uh, on and they are owned by you, you own their progeny um, by design, um, and it costs you nothing to produce another enslaved person other than the care of the person who is their parent. And so you produce this enslaved person who has value, and then you have to provide this person with some rations, clothing, etc. And you can think of that net of what they produce for you in terms of the market or services that they provide to you uh, for your life and the market value of, of those. And that has been the way that economists have traditionally thought about the cost of enslavement. If you turn that around, what you've done is you've taken someone's agency completely from them in every aspect of their life. And that's where this is a really different idea about labor supply. So one you know, very rudimentary way of thinking about supplying labor in a job is I'm giving my employer my time, and in exchange for that time, my employer pays me a wage. But that is done under more or less free will, such that if your employer said, I'm going to pay you half of what I typically did, you could certainly say, well, then I'm not going to give you any more of my time. You can't do that under enslavement. So there's no way of fully capturing how much someone value their ability to not work right, in this enslavement system. And that is what we have to incorporate because that is a real cost of enslavement. And it's born entirely by enslaved people. It's not something that the enslaver actually even has to think about calculating because there is no escape from this enslavement system. But for the enslaved themselves, there is a value that they would attach to their lives, that they do attach to their lives. One of the things that led me to think about this project is the work of narrative historians. And um, Litwack, for example, in particular, talks about that immediately after uh, emancipation, one of the things that the formerly enslaved would do is simply just get up and move about as they wanted and say, I'm just going to go into town, right? Which we wouldn't think of as being some extraordinary thing, unless it is something that is explicitly forbidden for you to do, unless you have explicit permission from your enslaver. So something just as simple as taking time after work to do something that you want to enjoy is not something that enslaved people took for granted. And that has value because it was taken from enslaved people during enslavement. There is a decline in output after emancipation, right? So people do produce less. However, what happens is the cost go down much further. Right? And so that's actually the difference, right? The difference between the cost going down significantly versus the decreased output, that gap is really the gain that we have from emancipation. Because now you have something that's much better functioning as a market economy, where you can really think about the labor input as the labor input itself. And so this value varies in a couple of different ways. So it varies whether or not you're accounting for where that difference is coming from. So if we only think about the difference as coming from the movement away from the gang labor system, which certainly dissolved after emancipation, 
that's a relatively small gain, but it's still really significant in terms of a share of GDP. Another way of thinking about this is the value of people's lives. We use the value of a statistical life, which is thinking about the holistic value of their lives. And that's a much larger estimate in terms of the share of GDP, because, of course, that cost decrease is much larger than um, the output decrease. And we also try to measure this when we're thinking about the South in terms of cotton growing states versus the South in general, what we might call Old South, New South. Old South being Virginia, North Carolina, New South being places like Mississippi and Alabama. And you do see larger gains to this because, of course, the concentration of the gang labor system, et cetera, in these cotton growing states, there is a larger gain in terms of the increased productivity in those states relative to the South overall. And of course, if you think about this as Southern GDP versus national GDP, it's a much larger gain for the South than it is for the nation as a whole. I think if there was one thing that I would want to leave people with in thinking about this topic in particular, it is that we really do need to incorporate and think about as economists, as humanists, as, as, as everyone, and particularly as we grapple with issues about American history, we really do need to interrogate why the humanity of enslaved people has been a topic that has not been sufficiently explored. We have looked at enslaved people as, I would say, inanimate labor and not really thought about holistically their lives. And that follows for a lot of reasons. We don't have um, as many textual sources where enslaved people are speaking for themselves. We do have the WPA narratives and some other sources, but of course we don't have, because of the institution of enslavement, more testimony about the life of enslaved people. But we do have enough to actually capture several features about their lives and about how people who had escaped enslavement would talk about the fact that they would rather die than go back to enslavement, which says something about its cost. But underneath all of that is this humanizing aspect of thinking about the lives of enslaved people and what enslavement was and what it did to human beings. And so we've talked about it institutionally. We talk about whether it's a cause of the Civil War. We talk about what it means for productivity. But we haven't thought about it as a day-to-day -day process that did things to people and in which people had to make constrained decisions where people had all of their agency taken from them. And we still haven't really dealt publicly and nationally with a conversation about what that has meant for those people and what it means to, in particular, racial inequality today. And so that is that arc of that dehumanizing process that I think still continues. And thinking about it just in terms of productivity is one way of forcing that for economists to confront it. But there are many other dimensions uh, that I think people should be thinking about.